Good morning. Welcome to Haymarket Baptist Church. We are thrilled to have you here today. Uh, if you are the one on your pew seated closest to the center aisle, would you take the little black book you'll find there, our worship register, and uh, please sign in with a name. And then whatever contact information you'd like to give us, you can give us your a phone number, you can give us a home address, or if you prefer an email address, but just uh, some way to have a contact with you, we'd appreciate that. And pass it to the outside, and when it reaches the outside, whoever's last, then send it back and leave it in the middle where it started. We have a lot of announcements, which I'll get to in just a moment, but you may have noticed that Ken Trammell is not here today. We're thrilled to have John Fitz. Thank you, John, for, let's show John appreciation. Now, John's been sort of on call, but he got the call this morning because Ken's wife went into labor and Diana just delivered. Tamar Ariel Tremel, seven pounds, 20 inches, born about 30 minutes ago. Congratulations. <laughs> and we have a lot of other announcements that uh, seem, although they're important, they're not as important as the new baby. <laughs> That's the most important of all. Uh, I will call your attention to some, though. Um, you'll see we have story time coming up on July 17th for children. So an announcement there. We, uh, goodness sakes, we've had a lot of things going on. Um, our, our preschool and kindergarten actually has some part-time openings. If you love teaching children, uh, that would be something that you could do. And uh, you have information to contact uh, Lori Fraz, the director of the preschool. Uh, just shoot her an email if you or somebody in your family or a friend of yours is uh, interested in a part-time job teaching children. That might be a possibility for you. We have been starting the renovation of our kitchen. And if uh, three months ago or six months ago you brought your favorite platter here to church for a church event and you forgot and you left it in the kitchen, it is now in the fellowship hall along with lots and lots and lots of other stuff. But if there's something you always meant to get back, I mean, not something your neighbor that you wanted to get. I mean, something belongs to you now, let's be clear. <laughs> but you can go after worship uh, and just pick up your platter or, or dish or whatever it was and, and take that home. This is a great time for us to, to get things back if, if, if anybody wanted those things back. We have deacon nominations, and uh, you'll be voting on them. If you're a member of this church, please come this Wednesday night to business meeting. Uh, 7 p.m., we'll be electing new deacons and new committee members. Uh, Baptist churches uh, operate by the congregational rule. That is, the vote of the majority has final say. And so we need you to come and, uh, and vote on new deacons and committee chairs and committee members, rather, uh, this Wednesday, so please uh, please do that. And uh, let's see, Morgan Jones has asked if he could come and give it an, an update, an announcement uh, about the Associate Pastor Search Committee. And and she, he's got he, Morgan's involved in a lot of things, so he's got a couple things to mention. So I'll let him come and add to whatever he needs to add to. Thank you. He sort of gave me an open platform here. You might be stuck here for a while. Who knows? Um, yeah. Basically, it's up to me. I gave Anne the wrong time for the associate pastor search committee meeting tomorrow night, so I should own up to it and give you the correct time, which is 6.30 tomorrow night. So all the members of that committee were meeting here in the youth room at 6.30 tomorrow night. Um, the other thing is, a couple years ago, the church decided, the church realized that probably the most common way, other than driving by in front of our church, that people find our church is, how would you guess? How would you find a church if you're in a new town? Internet. And we've had a internet presence for years, I mean maybe more than a decade, but we decided it was time to update that website. And that was two years ago, and I'm happy to announce that we have got the new website live as of yesterday. And all of you were probably going to tell me that because you visit that website every day, don't you? <laughs> no. Um, we're actually on two addresses and the old address that everyone's familiar with will be updated tomorrow the new address has already been updated so please go there look at the website tell me what you think tell me what's missing tell me what I should take off because um, I'm sort of the responsible person now 
Um, but we're trying to make it something that reflects our church, gets people to want to come here, and it's also got some stuff for members, too, to help you keep up to date with what's going on in the church. So please go check that out. Um, if it's still working on the TV out here in the foyer, there are pictures of the website and the new address is all there. It'll come out in the newsletter this um, in August and in the next bulletin so you can all see it. Thank you. We have a lot of uh, guests here today and uh, so I'd like to ask that all of us stand and greet those uh, around you. Please, please greet those people around you. It is good that we uh, give a warm welcome to everyone who's here in worship, um, but we now must begin to shift our focus away from those around us, and we begin now to focus on the Lord. So please bow with me as we pray. Father, you've given us a beautiful day. You've also given us teenagers, and today eight of them will leave on their trip to Greenville, South Carolina. We pray that you would bless them and give them a safe journey. We thank you for the good news of the new baby, Tamar Ariel Trammell, and pray that you will bless Ken and Diana as the new parents. But most of all, Father, we thank you that we have a chance to come and to worship you and to hear your word read. And we pray that you would speak to us in our hearts as we hear the words of the Bible. And we give you special thanks for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us so many things, including the way we should pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
please take the white hymnal in front of you, or if you're in the first uh, pew, it's underneath, uh, below your feet. Uh, and let's turn to number 339 for a responsive reading. I'll read the worship leader portion. Everyone read the bold face labeled worshipers, but then note that there's a place for women to read and a place for men to read. So you really got to pay close attention today. 339. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I will delight in your statutes. Lord, your word is forever. It is firmly fixed in heaven. How can a young man keep his way pure? By, By keeping your word. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. For every one of God's promises is yes in him. I will, I will not forget your word. I put my hope in your word. I rise before dawn and cry out for help. I put my hope in your word. Let my cry reach you, Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. The entirety of your word is truth, and all your righteous judgments endure forever. I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And now turn to the front of the hymnal, to hymn number 30. We're going to sing, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. And this is a hymn you sing all the way through once, and at the very bottom of the second page, it, it, it has an ending that you'll see with a one, and then we go back and sing the whole thing through, and we go to the ending that's labeled two. So let's stand, and we will sing hymn number 30. Come, now is the time to worship. First scripture reading today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 21, verses 12 through 25. In the Pew Bible, it's on page 118, 
And I found that out because I was going to use my own Bible, but I felt I had spilt, found I had spilled something on it. I'm not sure that shows I'm very diligent in reading my Bible or very clumsy when I'm carrying it. <laughs> uh, but we will read 21, starting with verse 12. Anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, it is not done if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are to flee to a place I will designate. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. Anyone who attacks their father or mother is to be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put, is to, be put to death whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. If people quarrel and one person hits another with a stone or with their fist and the victim does not die but is confined to bed, the one who struck the blow will not be held liable if the other can get up and walk around outside with the staff. However, the guilty party must pay the injured person for any loss of time and see that the victim is completely healed. Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a re direct result, but they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two since the slave is their property. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wood for wound, bruise for bruise. Now we would like to invite all the children to come forward for the children's story. Sometimes we have so many rules in our home, and then we have rules at school and other rules at church. Sometimes I get tired of rules. And Lisa said, yeah, I know what you mean. We have a lot of them. And then Jeffrey had a friend, Mike. And Mike was talking one day. Pardon? Go ahead. If you want the girl. But this particular story involves a girl. <laughs> Jeffrey's friend Mike invited him to come over and play. And they were chatting. And, and Mike said, you'll love our house. We don't have any rules at all. I can do anything I want, and so can you. And Jeffrey thought, that might be lots of fun. No rules. And so he went over to Mike's house. And they went in. The house was a little bit messy, you know. But... Uh, Mike said, hey, let's go get some ice cream. And Jeffrey said, but it's 10 in the morning. Are we allowed to wait till after lunch? And, no, we don't have rules. Let's go get ice cream. So they got ice cream from uh, the freezer. And Jeffrey thought, this is pretty neat. And, and then his friend Mike got out drinks, and they were goofing around a little bit. And Mike spilled the drink on the carpet. And Jeffrey said, I'll go get something to clean up. And Mike said, no, don't worry about it. Mom will get it later. We don't have any rules about that. You know, we can do whatever we want. A little later, Jeffrey had to use the bathroom, and he went in there, and it was stinky. It was 
Someone had not flushed the toilet. <laughs> and it was, oh, yuck. You know how it, it smells bad when someone doesn't flush the toilet? But Mike says, yeah, we don't have any rules about that, you know? So I don't have to flush if I don't want to. And Jeffrey said, yeah, but then the house starts to smell bad. And then his friend Mike turned on TV and there was a movie that said R-rated. And Jeffrey said, I'm not allowed to watch that. And Mike said, I can watch anything I want. And then they had this gory, gruesome scene. And Jeffrey said, I, I don't, that's too much blood. I don't want to watch that. And by the time it was time for lunch, Jeffrey had decided that a house with no rules is really not such a great place after all. He was pretty grateful for the rules his mom and dad had because really most of the time they had rules because they loved Jeffrey and Lisa and they don't want to get hurt and they want them to live in a nice house. And so that's that's the way that Jeffrey learned a little bit more about how rules are important to have. Even though sometimes they don't like them, they really make our lives a lot better. And that's why moms and dads, most of them anyway, not Mike's mom and dad, I guess, but most moms and dads have rules to make our lives better. Now, we're going to have a prayer in a minute, but uh, we have an announcement first about children's goods. So I just want to remind everybody that come September, these beautiful little children still are in need of some teachers. So if you could please... We have them. teachers for today. Yes, yeah, so we have teachers for September. We do have some folks that wish to take off. Um, they've been teaching for three years. And so we have two age groups right now. Ideally, I'd love to have three age groups. So I'll be okay with two. But please, um, pray about this and see how God's leading you. The little children are, um, you know, the future. And we have so much uh, knowledge and love for Jesus in our hearts that it would be so wonderful for us to impart that to these little children. And uh, I just ask that you pray over this over the next couple of weeks. And contact me. Again, my name is Brenda Knighton. And um, you can find my information in the directory. Or you can call, call the church office or tell me. And any of either of us will be If we fine. have at least two teachers, class, we rotate every month or every other month, so you're not missing worship every single week, um, but alternating by month, and um, I've done this for three years now, I hope to continue, and it is uh, just a, a joy and a blessing, I get so blessed from these little children every week, they actually kind of teach me a little something as well, so um, just pray about that if you would, please, thank you. Thank you. All right, boys and girls, we're going to pray, and then we, our teachers are going to take you to children's Sunday school, okay? That's precious. Father, I thank you for each girl and for each boy who is here today. And I pray that you'll bless them as they go to Sunday school. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you, girls, and thank you, boys. You just want me to teach you whatever the teacher says. Let's take our white hymnals again and turn to hymn number 433. It's going to be our offertory hymn, I Surrender All. So once you have the hymnal, let's stand.
please pray with me? Lord, we know that everything we have comes from you. As we just read, let us be doers of the word and not just hearers. With a generous heart, may we return a portion of the financial resources you have provided us. Guide our church in the use of these tithes and offerings to further your kingdom and your glory. We pray that you extend and multiply their reach and influence so that they are a great blessing to many. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.
Dwyer, that was excellent. And John, thank you with such little notice, and you're here, and you lead us. Thank you very much. The scripture on which I'll base my sermon today is Exodus 22, verses 16 through 27. Now, you can take out a Red Pew Bible if you forgot your Bibles. It's page 121, and they're in front of you, or if you're in the first pew, they're underneath of you. So let's take a look together at Exodus 22, 16 through 27. We've been working through Exodus for the past couple months. If a man seduces a virgin who is not pledged to be married and sleeps with her, he must pay the bride price, and she shall be his wife. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he must still pay the bride price for virgins. Do not allow a sorceress to live. Anyone who has sexual relations with an animal is to be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord must be destroyed. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused and I will kill you with a sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. If you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not treat it like a business deal. Charge no interest. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, return it by sunset because that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in? When they cry out to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. This is the word of God for the people of God. For those of you who are visiting and don't come regularly, you might be thinking, why in the world would they pick all these passages from Exodus about strange laws, some of which seem pretty brutal? Those of you who've been reading through Exodus um, may understand why we're doing this, because it's part of Exodus. We're working through it. But some of you might have been thinking, he could have just skipped these chapters, you know. That would have been less embarrassing to read some of these things. But if we believe that the entire Bible is inspired, I think we've got to learn and ask ourselves, how do we deal with it? What do we read in the Old Testament? It's fine when we hop to Exodus 20 and look at the Ten Commandments and people go, oh yeah, yeah, that's it. We understand the need for the Ten Commandments. But the, the rabbis said there were about 613 laws in the entire Old Testament. And some of them make perfectly good sense, other of them are very different from anything we would have today. And uh, I think it's important as we go through Exodus that we deal with not just the parts that we know, but even some of the more difficult parts. Let's take a look and see what do they have to say and why are they there. Now there are plenty of rules in addition to the Ten Commandments that make good sense uh, for us, or we at least understand why it was there. Uh, there are rules against kidnapping, which is a violation of the Eighth Commandment about stealing. Uh, there's a Penalties for murder, and every society has penalties for murder. Uh, we have our own debates about whether we should have capital punishment or not, but that clearly was something they had in the Old Testament times. And they had the law of lex talionis, which restricted punishment to say you can't do more to the person who hurt you than they did to you. If they knocked out your tooth, you can do nothing more than knock out their tooth. You can't kill them. If they blinded you, the most you could do would be to blind them in return. You can't kill them. So there were reasons for laws like this. But, but some of the laws we read today were pretty tough. Did you notice that as we went through? How many of you noticed at least one or two laws that you thought, ooh, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty brutal? Yeah, lots of you. Absolutely. Well, uh, we have teenagers here. They're going to a mission trip today. That we're going down to, to Greenville, South Carolina to, to Passport. Uh, we're going to do some mission projects there. We love our teenagers. Uh, and as a teenager, at some point along the way, I discovered there was a rule in the Old Testament. Now, you might generalize it by saying there was a rule that say teenagers uh, should not curse their parents. And we'd all go, well, that's a, that's a good rule. That, that's fine. But, but more specifically, here's what it says. Uh, you know, if, a, if someone curses his father, he shall be put to death. Well, now that's pretty severe, and we don't want our people to, to do that. When you come across laws like this, it reminds us 
that people who want to seriously interpret and understand the Bible have to have at least some method of interpretation. Now, of course, you could go and earn a master's degree like Ruth Ann is working, getting her second master's, this one a master's of divinity, and you can take advanced classes on Bible. And, uh, there are even PhD programs, and you can do that, but everybody's not going to take those classes. And so what do we want to say? What kind of a rule of interpretation can we have? Uh, if we have a rule that says a sorceress should be executed, and we don't want you to go out and find somebody who says she's a witch and, and execute her. That would be awful. Uh, we, we have a, a rule here against charging interest. And yet if one of you was working at a local bank and you said, I think we should stop charging interest, you would certainly be the unemployed person from the local bank because that's how banks operate. That's how they make their, their money. And when we come across a passage like 2220, whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord must be destroyed, you might say, well, what about religious freedom? After all, Baptists have been a leader in religious freedom. Uh, one of the, the earliest Baptist church of all in England, 1609, led by John Smith and Thomas Hellas, they wrote these words. The magistrate, the local official, is not by virtue of office to meddle with religion or matters of conscience or to force or compel men to this or that form of religion or doctrine, but to leave Christian religion free to every man's conscience. Well, that's something I think all of us would agree with, religious freedom for all people. So we may disagree with uh, another church down the street on some point of doctrine, or there may be a synagogue or a mosque or a, a temple, and we would say that's even a completely different religion from Christianity, but, but we would all agree that they have a right to be here in the United States, that we have a First Amendment. Well, how do we put this together with these rules in the Old Testament? I would say one rule that we should all follow is that though the entire Bible is inspired, the New Testament, the portion that tells us about Jesus, always supersedes the Old Testament. When you see a difference, go with the New Testament and more specifically, go with Jesus. How did Jesus deal with these passages? What did he have to say? And, and that keeps us from terrible mistakes. About 20 years ago, there was an article in the paper about a minister in the mountains of southwest Virginia, and he had decided, I'm just going to do things as I find in the Bible. And he found in the Bible where some of the patriarchs had two wives, so he took them two wives. That created a bit of a stir, didn't it? A rule is to say, let's see what happened between the Old and the New Testament. When Jesus talked about marriage, he never talked about having two wives. He said, when a man shall leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, singular, and the two shall become one, one flesh, one. And so we let Jesus be our guide to interpreting the entire Bible. There are many passages in the Bible that teach us good things. But let's make sure we focus on Jesus first of all. In some churches where I've been a pastor, uh, I've had a pastor's class for people that are thinking about making a decision for Christ. Often the older children or teenagers would take these classes. We never start with Exodus or Leviticus. We start with guess who? We start with Jesus. We read one of the Gospels because it's crucial to start and get the most important thing first. You can become a Christian without knowing the fine points of Leviticus. You cannot become a Christian without understanding something about Jesus. He is the most important one. If we read about a death penalty for adultery in the Old Testament, we turn to the New Testament and we see a story in the Gospel of John about Jesus and a woman caught in adultery. And some of the Jews in the area, they brought her to Jesus and threw her right down at his feet and said, Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The Old Testament says we should stone her to death. What do you say? And what did Jesus reply? Some of you remember. What did he say? Let him who is without sin 
cast the first stone. And then it says, one by one, starting with the oldest, they dropped their stones and they walked away. Jesus is the one who guides us on how we interpret Scripture. He is the one that gives us the clues on what's most important and how to do things. We have this death penalty for a wayward son cursing his father. Jesus tells a story about a young man. We don't know if he cursed his father, but he certainly disrespected his father. It's the, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, Jesus doesn't tell the story to say it's okay to be disrespectful for your dad. It, the story is told in such a way that you know Jesus is not happy with the young man that, that took his father's inheritance or his portion of it and ran off and wasted all of it. But the father loved the son nonetheless. And as Jesus told the story, the young man finally came to his senses. We would say he repented. And he came back to his father asking not to be restored as a son, but he had a speech prepared. Father, make me like one of your hired servants because they're eating better than I eat now that all my money is gone. And I'll just work for you in the fields as a hired worker. And his father, how did he respond? He said, I'm going to run out. I'm going to throw my arms around him and hug him. I'm going to say, let's kill the fattened calf. We're going to have a party and celebrate. My boy has come back home. That's the love of the Father. That's how Jesus teaches it. Is it right the young man was disrespectful? No, it wasn't. But there is forgiveness, absolutely. We see in the Old Testament this death penalty for those who sacrifice to other gods. But when we get to Jesus, we see him not saying all religions are equal. Jesus never says anything like that. He believes that through Judaism and the Old Testament, we have the story about the one true God. But when Jesus interacts with people who are Gentiles, not Jewish, you look at the compassion he has for them. He heals the Samaritan leper. He has got another Samaritan woman at the well that he sits down and has a long conversation with and he reveals that he in fact is the Messiah to her. And when he comes and he's told about a Roman centurion, who by virtue of his office as a centurion in the Roman army, almost certainly had to sacrifice to Caesar. That was a normal thing they did. Jesus doesn't affirm him being uh, sacrificing to Caesar, but Jesus has great compassion. And when some of the Jewish leaders say, look, this particular centurion's a good guy. In fact, he even helped us build our local synagogue. And his servant is deathly ill. Jesus, would you heal his servant? He, he deserves you to do this. And Jesus starts going to his house. He's going to heal the servant. And the centurion sends messengers and says, Lord, I don't even deserve to have you come to my house. You're a great religious leader, and I'm not. But I understand authority, and I'm just going to say, if you would just say the word, I'm confident that my servant will be healed. And Jesus took that, instead of attacking the man, said, I haven't found a faith like this in all of Israel. Those are the words from Jesus. He is the one who sets up the idea of religious freedom, where there is no coercion involved whatsoever, but instead we go out not to coerce people to become Christians, but to share the good news of God's love so that they can willingly choose, if they wish, to become followers. That's all based on the New Testament and more specifically on the teachings of Jesus. It is important for us as believers to read the entire Bible and not just skip over the parts we don't like. I remember when I first got to seminary and, and I, I come across some of these difficulties and I thought, why didn't I ever come across these in Sunday school? And I was a youth minister at Hickory Grove Baptist, and we had a Sunday school lesson, and happened to be going through a book of the Bible, and they were coming to a really tough chapter. I don't remember what chapter it was at this point, but I know it was a tough one. I've been studying it in school, and I thought, I wonder how the Sunday school is going to deal with this. Maybe let's pretend it was chapter 6. And the Sunday school did this. One week they did chapter 4, the next week chapter 5, the next week chapter 7, the next week chapter 8. That's exactly how they dealt with it. They just skipped it. <laughs> 
And, and for new, new people who are new to the faith, that's okay. You can just skip the, the tough parts. But, but obviously, as you grow as a Christian and you become more mature, you also have to look at the tough parts and not pretend they're not there, but develop a way to deal with them. And I think a key rule for us all is to always look to Jesus and let him guide us on how we interpret and understand the entire Bible. And that's the, that's the challenge, and that's my invitation for you today. Uh, at the end of the service, we always have an invitation hymn or hymn of response. If there's anyone who, uh, who wants to make a decision for Christ, or if there's a Christian who's been visiting here for weeks or months, or maybe even longer than that, who wants to become a member here at Haymarket Baptist Church, this is an opportunity for you to make that decision. We will all turn in our hymnals, the white hymnals, to hymn number 154, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And let's stand and we'll sing together. be seated. Today, the young people of our church uh, are going to be heading out to Greenville, South Carolina to Passport. And uh, so I'd like for us as a congregation to affirm them. Uh, you have uh, an affirmation in the bulletin insert. I want to call the young people forward by name and have them stand right here uh, at the front. And then we young people bring yours so you know what to say. It's not real complicated, but bring it anyway, just to be sure. And I'll call you one at a, not, one at a time. <clears throat> Dustin Biol, if you would come forward and stand here at the front. And I'm doing this alphabetically, in case you thought I was favoring Dustin. And <laughs> I mean, he is my favorite, of course, but I mean, but, but alphabetically. <clears throat> Kendall Frazier. Caroline Lewis. Emma Christine Morgan, Dylan Sawyer, Will Sawyer, 
Joey Wolf and Taylor Wolf. Debbie Nelson, come stand with them. And is Hunter here yet? Hunter Workman? He's still in my way. Okay, hopefully he will meet us before the van leaves. <laughs> he's coming from Colorado, so the, the, he has a good excuse if he's a little bit late. Squeeze closer together so we can get a picture, please. All right, now let's take our uh, inserts. And I'm going to give a challenge to the youth mission team. And if you guys would respond both times by saying, we will. And then congregation, I'll give a charge to you. And you respond, we will. Young people, will you affirm before this congregation the call of God upon your life in these days to be his servants in Greenville, South Carolina? Will you be faithful in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed with those God brings in your way among the people of Greenville, South Carolina? We will. Will you be mindful of the witness you bear on this trip as you are among other Christians and among those who do not know Christ? that you may represent our Lord and your church in all honor and Christ likeness? Will you devote yourself to a special season of spiritual devotion on this journey that God may use these days and experience, experiences to draw you closer to Christ and give you a deeper knowledge of his will for your life? Amen. Haymarket Baptist Church, will you support your brothers and sisters in the faith in your daily prayers while they're away from us? Will you remember their families? And will you pray that they're able to share God's love with all the people they meet along the way? We will. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these young people. And we thank you for Debbie and for Hunter, who are going along as chaperones. And I pray for your blessing on myself as well. Give us a safe trip there and back. But more than that, let us make an impact. Let us draw closer to Christ. Let us help the people that we are sent to in Greenville, South Carolina, and let this journey be one that draws all of us closer to your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, young people, you can go back to your families. Thank you so much. Yes, at the end, if you would. Let's stand for our benediction prayer, and then we always have a song response to the words of the bulletin for those of you who are busy. Let's pray. Father, you've blessed us greatly with all the children here today, with our teenagers, uh, and we pray that we all, not just the teenagers, but all of us in this place, can bless others as we leave here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.